Hi guys, my name is Nicole Rohde. I'm a staff scientist and uh, direct the activities at Moat Aquaculture Research Park in Sarasota, Florida. So thanks for coming over to uh, share a little bit of time with me this afternoon. I just wanna thank uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Andrea Tarnecki for inviting me. If you don't, if you're not entertained, then it's all her fault. So okay, you can let her know, complaints afterwards. <laughs> So um, thanks again. Like I said, um, my facility is located in Sarasota, Florida. So on the West Coast there, um, it's about 17 miles inland. And hopefully I'll just get to tell you a little bit about today, uh, some of the work that we're doing overall um, at our laboratory, um, but specifically some of the things that we were doing with bivalves. I thought uh, for your group, it might be, might be interesting for y'all. So just to kind of go over a, a quick roadmap of uh, the things I want to talk about again, just the park where I come from in case um, anybody, has anybody ever been to Moat Aquaculture Research Park or Moat Marine Laboratory? Yeah, a couple people. Yeah, you put your hand down. No. <laughs> um, so we'll talk a little bit about the research, the different programs that we have there. Um, there's a number of different centers for research focusing on all different kinds of things, everywhere from marine mammals to ecotoxicology, um, sharks, you, you name it, they're working on it. Um, we do a lot of different types of collaborations, both educationally, we work with industry, with different school groups, uh, we have all kinds of fishing clinics, so we work very closely, closely with the fisheries and ecology department. And then we're going to talk a little bit about some of the areas that we're working in with where we've got the industry challenges, and that's where some of the, the bivalve work comes in, as well as a number of the other things that we do um, in terms of conservation aquaculture as well. So then uh, at the end, if you've got any questions, I'd be happy to hang around and answer those too. So again, the primary goal uh, for the Aquaculture Research Park is really about conservation and, and ocean resources through um, that program and fisheries enhancement. So we work side by side with them. We're actually located um, on that campus together. So I think for a lot of institutions right now, you know, everybody knows we're trying to feed this growing population that we've got. So all the areas that are listed here that probably most of you folks are familiar with and working on too, food security, nutrition, health, um, the impact that some of the seafood industry is having, like the issues with the economy, um, how we're importing everything, and um, basically livelihoods. It's a really important part of it too. Um, people are working and would like to continue working. So a lot of the things that we focus on are related to trying to solve problems in, in that area. So just overall trying to expand the availability of seafood resources and also that conservation aspect. So that might be nice too, to show a little video. Uh, so you can see for those of you that haven't been to the aquaculture park, um, exactly what it looks like and tell you a little bit about it. So here we've got about 200 acres uh, of land uh, that Moat Scientific Foundation purchased a number of years ago. And that area there that you can see, we host kids fishing clinics. Um, we call that the retirement pond. Some of our conservation species like common snook that we've got that are big sport fish, of course, for us along the Gulf Coast. Uh, we put them in there uh, when we're done using them for different research things. We've got a whole nice little ecosystem going in the pond there. And then we've got a number of buildings. So this is one of the largest um, marine zero discharge recirculating facilities that I'm aware of in the U.S. So we store all our water, we can operate in um, full strength seawater. We have the ability to operate in brackish water as well. So we've got storage for just about everything there. You can see the buildings are pretty large. Um, so inside those tanks, all the filtration you can imagine that goes with um, large wastewater treatment plants. So that's essentially what we're operating there. So we've been able to design and share a lot of different technologies and come up with some solutions for challenges that folks have had uh, that want to work in them. That's one of our, our big um, capabilities to be able to do, especially with some of the challenges with coastal resources and the cost of land. This idea uh, came about a number of years ago to build this facility here. Again, working in greenhouses and buildings as well. So we've got, got quite a few different footprints. So, so also just some of the other areas that we're focused on, of course, it's all sustainable farming. So land-based recirculating systems, as I said, developing and standardizing the technology, looking at cost efficiency things, reducing the discharge for saltwater, energy demands, and trying to work with industry to reduce operating costs if that's the type of system that they're going to be able to work in. We're actually doing a lot of 
work too with um, these aquaponics systems. So we've got a fair number of different products that we're growing in there. We've got something called Sea Purse Lane, which grows locally, coastally. Um, it grows pretty fast. We can do full raceway. It can be reduced every 30 days, really high nutritional value, a lot of antioxidants, vitamins, and big interest uh, in the pharmaceutical industry industry as well, not just um, as sea veggies for salads or making something nice um, in terms of like a pesto and things. We've got all kinds of local shell chefs that are working with us there, trying different markets for these things, health food, drinks, you name it. They're trying to put all of these different things in there to come up with different products to, to sell and use. So in terms of the pharmaceutical side of it, the interest is coming from the cosmetic as well. Um, so we could use face cream, you name it. They want to try it. We've also got some uh, saltwater kale growing there and other macro algae that are being produced. And again, looking at the cost uh, benefit for all these things and the fish that we're growing specifically in these units is actually redfish. So that's a big interest there um, for our, our area. The other area of research that we've been developing for a couple of years now is this uh, cultivated seafoods. So new markets to look for. So producing cell lines for different marine species. We worked on redfish, almaco jack, um, Pacific white shrimp, and just basically supporting development of alternative seafoods. So again, reducing that, that environmental impact. And a lot of folks have asked me like, is this a real thing? I said, yep, yeah, absolutely. We were in Singapore um, late last year and these groups have been putting out a number of uh, patents and getting this technology ready for use. So they're already selling it in different areas. So it's been successful. So we have a couple of cell lines that we've been working on developing um, with the team, different disciplines. So the other part of it is partnerships. I mentioned earlier that we have a fair number of industry partnerships. So the lab is really focused on trying to solve problems, bottlenecks. Um, a lot of folks from the industry come to us and say, hey, you know, we've got this problem. Do you have a footprint that you could help us? So we're able to try to do that where we can. This is one of the projects we worked on with Triple Tail where we did some research um, on the grow out and a market for that. Other projects that are kind of cool, I've uh, got, again, that conservation aquaculture aspect. We're working with the Georgia Aquarium because a lot of the aquariums are interested in sustainable seafoods as well. So they've got a lot of marine mammals and other animals to feed. So we're gonna be working on mullet. We're bringing broodstock in and trying to raise those fingerlings up and doing some economic analysis to see if the um, aquarium industry will be able to utilize that as a, a food source to help in that arena. Also working not just with fish, but with stone crab. Uh, that's a recent project that we've had for a couple of years now. We're looking at commercial scale production for aquaculture. So a lot of new technologies there. Uh, lots of folks that come to Florida love to eat stone crab claws. They're pretty tasty. And they're looking to see, you know, what the economic viability of that is. So we're working out some of the biological aspects and looking into basically some of the bio biology of the species that will help us determine um, just what the, the production plan might look like for that. So in terms of other uh, directions and research, we spent a lot of time dealing with different species of broodstock, we worked with Florida pompano, redfish, uh, different species of uh, seriola. We've had amberjack, almaco jack, a lot of different, different areas there and looking at just the spawning performance metrics, types of diets that we might need to use to improve egg quality. Another big ob objective that we've had were um, looking at probiotics to inhibit growth and pathogens and microbial communities. That's been a, a big interest in the recirculating uh, facility that we have there. And then also we worked a lot on transport protocols. You've got to get animals from one place to another, whether that's land or sea. So we've done a lot with shipping technologies, uh, stocking densities, that sort of thing to try to improve uh, viability during transport. So that kind of brings me more to the main topic that I was going to chat with you guys about today and tell you a little about, bit about that research. About four years ago, they built um, a, a building on our property as now called the Red Tide Institute at Moat Aquaculture Research Park. And the primary purpose of that was the state of Florida, we've got major problems with red tide. So lots of hab problems around the world, harmful algal blooms in general, but particularly in Florida, the red tide is a major economic killer of all things, tourism, seafood, it's just been a real problem. So state of Florida uh, supported us 
to try to do mitigation technologies to get rid of the red tide. But my focus has been on the economic mitigation side. Shellfish farmers have been just crushed by this issue. They get closed down um, when the cell counts reach a certain level and the red tide has just been lasting longer and longer. So their leases have been closed down for more period of time um, in, in some cases like over a year. And so that's just not sustainable. So they were looking at ways that we might be able to help them to overcome some of the challenges and have lots of colleagues um, at the lab that are working on all different aspects. This is just one, uh, they're doing some great work there. And again, this is just one, one piece of the puzzle. So just to give you a little bit of background, the economic loss is in the tens of millions. Uh, you know, oysters, clams, we used to have um, just in a region south of where I'm at, there were like 56 farmers. And as of last year, there were four. And shortly before I came over here, the last couple of those folks gave me a call and said, you know what, we're just going to shut down because we can't, we can't continue. So there's actually zero farmers left in an area that used to produce probably 50% of what went out to the state of Florida and was even sold beyond that. So that just gives you kind of an idea of the scope of how difficult it's been in the last five to 10 years in terms of red tide, the frequency of it and how long it stays. So just for you guys, if you're not familiar with how it works, the, for, for us, at least in Florida, uh, they're prohibited to harvest after it's 5,000 uh, Carnia brava cells per quart. And that's all regulated. They come out, regulatory bodies come out and do the testing and they close the lease sites. Of course, there's a health concern for that. So that's why they're, they're shutting it down. Toxins can reach a level in the shellfish and, and cause neuro, neurotoxic shellfish poisoning. So nobody wants NSP. It doesn't sound like a very a pleasant thing. So of course they wanna check. And unfortunately, the challenge is that they're not able to reopen uh, unless they come out and they test the animals. And on the ELISA, they're less than uh, 1.6 ppms for the clams and 1.8 for the oysters. And uh, there's also the test, of course, for mouse bioassay, uh, but we won't we won't really go into that because the main one that I'm looking at is the the ELISA for now. So that's kind of the deal. They have to wait until those animals reach that. And red tide can be really patchy. You can have a lease site that's a thousand yards away and they're open and you're closed and it can flip flop. So looking for solutions of how these farmers can handle this situation uh, became a pretty big, big story for us there. So over the last two years, we did a lot of work with a number of species. We used the hard clam, we had the, the native sunray venus clam, to Florida, and also we were working with the oysters. The, Work that I'm just chatting about here is primarily based on the clam work that we've done. Um, the idea was to build a system that could actually hold commercial scale numbers of individuals. And I know that depends on whether you're, you know, a small, medium, large scale farm, who you're selling to. So that can mean different things to different people. But uh, the largest number of animals that we've held in a single raceway system that's built into compartments, and I'll show you a little bit about the design of that is 30,000. So the idea was to do the work initially with several hundred individuals, try to work out some parameters and then move up to commercial scale because that's what farmers are gonna actually need to use if they're gonna be doing this. So again, all recirculating, zero discharge. So we had to come up with a filtration system that we felt was gonna be robust enough to see if it could even um, capture some of the brevitoxins that are released. And we were working um, again in full strength seawater for this particular so project, so around 30 ppt. So this is just a quick diagram of the system, so you can see in some photos of what it looks like. It's pretty pretty large setup um, in a small footprint. Probably could do a, a fair number of things more in terms of vertical storage. There's probably a hundred ways that you could do this. The filtration is really the the primary thing that that matters about it. Um, the operational volume, we were able to use a really small volume of water, or we can stack the trays, use large volume. It just depends on the footprint that you have. We've tried it both ways. Uh, the primary filtration components are the carbon filter. And of course, we have biological filtration because you have to have the animals in there for any given time. That's going to be important. We've got UV sterilization and just doing all the calculations in terms of the engineering to make sure we're dealing with the kill rates and the uh, flow rates are, are pretty high um, to accommodate some of the needs of the shellfish. So we also did the work feeding them during the depuration or purge process. 
and with without. Um, so I'll show you, talk a little bit about that too in a minute. So this particular study that I'm talking about here is with, again, the heart clams. They came out of Tampa Bay. There was actually a natural red tide bloom because we've had so many of them. We decided it might be better to take advantage of that. We do culture the Karenia on site at the laboratory, but in order to get enough Karenia to do these kinds of studies repeatedly, um, it can be challenging sometimes, especially when I wanted to fluctuate the different water volumes, but taking advantage of the, the live bloom or the wild bloom was, was really fortunate for me, not so much for the farmers, but at least I'm able to you know, show what it's really like out there and um, a real life situation to bring them in. So again, in terms of tissue collection, uh, I had to take 150 clams per raceway. You can see I have a whole series of them there. And this is with 30,000 individuals. Uh, and 150 grams of tissue goes, you basically shuck, drain, weigh, homogenize. And then we have to send them off to Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission because that is our state certified lab. We actually are not permitted to run them at the laboratory. We have to send them out and that's exactly what the farmers would have to do anyway. So it's, it's positive in the sense of independent analysis being done. So I didn't make it up. Um, so again, the ELISA, um, and then we did follow up with a mouse bioassay. Uh, what happens is, is that if you don't pass or you pass, then they do these different things with the, the mouse bioassay based on that. So in terms of the results, um, it's pretty interesting because I was actually shocked at how quickly we were able to do this. I thought that it would actually take quite a bit longer because in previous works that I read or things that I saw or talked to in terms of the state regulatory folks or other people that had tried to do some smaller scale studies with this, that they get stuck sort of right before and don't depurate or purge that out right before they would be able to be um, considered that the lease would be open or safe for, for human consumption. So I was afraid they might hang around that area for longer, but um, the great news is, is that we did two studies where we've shown that basically within less than 48, about 48 hours, we're able to, from the time we bring them in off the lease site and they're measured, um, that the brevitoxin level is measured, we're able to do the depuration. So like I said, it's 1.6 to be uh, less than 1.6 opens you. So these clams came in really hot. They were around 5 ppm. So that's that's not small. And we wanted to get something that was naturally really hot because the idea is if we could do it quickly and the level of brevitoxin was really high in the tissues, you would think that if it was lower, which is more likely what a farmer would want, they wouldn't wait till it got so high, then it would be totally feasible. So that was the theory about waiting until it was, you know, really high level. So in about 24 hours, they come down uh, to about half the concentration. So just a about two and a half there. And then within 48 hours, they were below the limit. So the graph that you see there on the left uh, in the blue, that is the uh, PPM. And then I showed the same thing in just the nanograms per liter or nanograms per gram, which are the results again from, from FWC. So we did this exact same study with 15,000 and 10,000. And although the amount of brevitoxin varied in terms of when they came in, this is the highest one. And they all depurate about the same. So I think that this can be a system that really could be utilized by uh, the industry to help because it's incredible the loss that they have without, you know, the entire farm is just shut down. They can't sell the products. So instead of having the regulatory agencies just go out to the lease site, farmers would be able to bring in the animals and then they'd be able to just get the regulatory folks to come out and sample out of one of these recirculating systems instead. So again, 48 hour clearance from 5.2 to less than 0.2 PPM. It's all achieved with commercial scale numbers, which is the other concern. Again, what happens when you put that number of animals in the system? It's gonna be really different than if you're just using 500 to a thousand animals the wet storage already exists in terms of the approval process. So these guys go out, you know, nobody wants to bite into an oyster or, or clam and have grit in there. It's not too tasty, I'm sure. So the system's already approved. So it doesn't have to go through the same regulatory process um, because they can already use this for a different purpose. 
So the systems are already set up and exist on certain sites. They'll just require different filtration. And then anyone that doesn't have the system, I'm hoping to work to see what we can do to reduce the cost. Like the raceways that we use are fiberglass, et cetera. But there's a lot of different things that we might be able to do to reduce how much it costs. You can, you know, build things, line them. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, top of the line to to work. The the primary filtration components are the main thing that's important. And in terms of the the RAS technologies, there's a, still a lot of work to be done. We need to do some economic analysis. So we felt like, you know, according to what we got the feedback from the industry folks, that thirty thousand was a reasonable number to hold in just one of those raceway systems that you saw that I showed. But you could build whatever footprint you know the needs are to that facility. So I'm hoping that this type of work can really benefit some of the other um, groups out there that might be working with other HABs. Uh, I know it's a problem worldwide. Different people have different challenges. Um, but from, from our standpoint, for the consumption side, there's probably a lot of other types of research that can be done too. And there's a lot of questions to be answered. Um, we also think that this could be used for some shelf life extension studies. It's the same kind of thing. You could just add temperature control. Again, different expenses, you know, it depends on the model or the size of the the operation that you're they're using. I realize these guys work really on uh, you know, really tough margins in some areas of the country. So that all has to be worked out. But the whole purpose was to go forward and try to get the information and lay the groundwork so they could work with the FW FWC in in our case, um, you know, Fish and Wildlife, and then the FDA is of course they're controlling. Uh, what's what's going for consumption. So I hope that it'll be be a positive going forward. I think for the last two years, we've done about um, eight studies in total. Most of those were preliminary work. And then the last couple have been with the, the commercial scale numbers. So that's that's the idea behind it. And lots of people doing the work. Again, not not just me, but you know, there's chemists involved and all these other folks that are helping. We're also testing the water, looking at what's happening before and after the carbon so that we can get a feel for that. What happens to the carbon? You know, Is that gonna be a waste product or is that something we can clean up, maybe even reuse? So I think it's just a, a bit more on the engineering side, but it's a it's been a real, real positive. Uh, we think that there's a lot of potential for that. So with that, I just will take any questions that you might have about any of the work that we're doing, not just that. That's some very cool stuff. Um, I'm thinking from the consumer point of view, how variable is the decoration in these plants? And then is it still a bit of a game of rule that as well? Most of them have purged all this stuff, but maybe the odd one here and there. Or, or is it pretty consistent the money? It seems really consistent once they're brought into the system. You know, I'm sampling a pretty large number of individuals out of each one of those. Uh, different raceway compartments. The system I have is, you know, three different compartments for one of those long ones, all tied to the same filtration. And then there's four replicate units of that. And so all those samples are coming from different ones and they seem pretty uniform. I do think that there's a difference depending on the, the size of the tissues, of course, that you're collecting. But those samples, like if I pull 75 and then, you know, I take another pool two or three more times a day from different parts, um, most of these were done with middlenecks. So I think it looks pretty, pretty homogenous considering the number of samples we took. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. So the rubber toxin is going down. Where is it going? Or is it being degraded? Is it just being released through the water? We've been able to track where it goes to get some idea of how it's how it's working. Yeah, so we still have a lot of questions related to that. Um, you know, the way the shellfish metabolize and convert that does matter, right? This has only been done with clams. I did preliminary work with oysters, so I can't speak too much yet about that. But at least for the clams, I think most of this is being trapped in the carbon. That's my suspicion, because when we sample the before and after, we can see differences. But there are some challenges even with the tools that we have to do the measurements. You know, there's a lot of different, um, what they call PVTXs, you know, the, the brevitoxin itself. And 
the tests that currently exist measure certain things. I'm not a chemist. I'm a, you know, a, an animal husbandry person, but I suspect that it's being trapped there in the carbon. So it's released into the water and then that all recirculates, you know, to that one area. And then the way we've set up the ports to test the water, that's one of the big questions that we're looking to answer now. It's like, where is it all going? And are we sure that, you know, we're able to pull it out? Anybody else? Yeah. Is there, have you looked at the size of animals? See if you need different times for different size animals? So in terms of the clams, it looks like, interestingly, the smaller they are, the harder, the longer they hold on to the rotoxin. So the thing about this system, though, is that we used a variety. We started out having everybody be pretty uniform, and then I started to really mix things together instead of, like, sending them through a grater or anything like that. I'd say just, you know, instead of the tumbler, just give me whatever you pull off the lease. And it looks like the system is working even if you had a variety of sizes in there. So I think it's just a little bit more testing, re repeat, you know, enough times to make sure. The next steps are actually gonna take some of the grant money that we got to do this. And I'm gonna build um, with the help of the farmers, of course, the industry guys, uh, a system on their site. And they're gonna be allowed to use it repeatedly during a bloom. And we're gonna do all the testing from there and see what happens. You know, if they're shut down for a month or two months, they wouldn't be allowed to be sold until they, you know, make a decision. But then it's real world stuff there too, because they're coming straight off the lease, just like how they would do things. So I'll be interested to see how that works. Yeah. Yes. How much do you estimate that it's going to cost to build at the farm site? So I think it, that's actually another thing that we're doing right now. So the system that we have is probably, you know, the Maserati model. <laughs> you can definitely do things way cheaper. The cost of the tanks is the, the biggest expense and you can build anything to make a tank. So, you know, I'm hoping that I can work with them. So I have an understanding right now, the farm that I'm working with is in uh, Palmetto, which is just North of me, kind of in the Tampa Bay area. And based on their economic situation, you know, they're looking at, okay, electricity, what size pump, could we do this for less? So I don't have a solid number yet, but it's one of the things I definitely need to work out because it's the biggest question they have. What's it going to cost me? And is it going to be worth it? But if you're shut down for eight months, anything might be worth it at that point. So it's probably going to be sliding scale depending on your volume. Yeah. Yes. Is there a specific temperature and salinity range that works best for the system for the 48 hours? Or have you looked at different um, ranges uh, too? So I haven't done anything with temperature or salinity. I made sure that I just worked with those guys to match up whatever they were coming off the lease site on. I have a suspicion that, of course, you might be able to improve things even further if you if you can play with that. Um, you know, it's all about metabolism too. I mentioned a little bit the feeding versus the not feeding. Of course, that's another expense. Um, but I actually fed both. Um, I fed a, a live algae to them to try to increase the metabolism. But I also uh, used a a product that is a like a paste, frozen paste. You know, they they have these shellfish diets that that some folks use, other people don't. Uh, for different enrichments and there, there's products out there. So I just pulled one of those off the shelf that I was familiar with and tried it with that. And it, it worked pretty well. So even with feeding or not feeding or the two different types of products, the, I think feeding might speed things up a little bit more, but still have to do some more work. Yeah. So it's about optimization at this point. The first question was, can you even do this? Is it even possible or are you just like wasting your time? <laughs> and then the next question was, can you do it at commercial scale? And now it's like, okay, how do you make it economically viable? And what's really happening within the system? Where's all this stuff going? And that's why there's a whole lot of different disciplines. I'm more thinking about things on the recirculating technology side, the animal husbandry side, but there's, like I said, lots of people helping. So hopefully that'll work. 
effective day. You showed up to 48 hours. Did you sample longer to see did it stay low, like for uh, a couple more days, or just like you, you have data just to say that, yeah, if this will not only go low, but it will stay low? Yeah. Actually, yeah, I do have two studies where I collected the samples and I actually, they couldn't run them for me until later. So I just did it over like a 10 day period, even though there's no way nobody, nobody would want to actually have to do it that long. You know, they're always like 24 hours, make it happen. <laughs> the shorter the period, the better for them. Um, but that was just because of the nature of the FWC not being able to, to do the samples because they were busy at the time. And yeah, it, it's, you know, remains below the detectable limit. So I haven't seen anything where I, you know, something shot up somehow. Um, not so far. I have a chat question. Oh, let's see. I forgot about that part. Let's see. Uh, someone's just asking if it checked uh, to see if increasing the water temperature or changing the salinity or feeding aids um, in the PBTX removal. So yeah, it was answered. Mm -hmm. So anyone else, any questions? Nope. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I know that red tag has been around up in the 20th century, nothing, but nothing from 1800, nothing that was recorded in Florida? When, I remember, but, when did it start to happen on a, a quite consistent basis that it was like? So as far as I'm aware, um, I've just been conversing with the farmers there that the lease areas, for example, that they once didn't have any problems with, you know, they'd have a couple of different sites around the state and they'd say, oh, you know, we don't have any problem here. And there's still some regions like that. We have a region called Cedar Key that they haven't had any problems and uh, that I'm aware of yet, but it seems to be more frequent and coming into regions that it didn't previously. And so just in the last, I would say just conservatively for me and my knowledge area about that is like four or five years I've seen, you know, or heard them saying, you know, their experiences have been been more challenged with that. But I'm sure if we talk to to some of them that have been farming in those areas for 20 years, you know, they might say differently. I'm not sure. But that's my experience. That seems like in the last five years, it's gotten more difficult in terms of them being able to harvest. And that's why we've lost so many farms. I mean, to have to go from 56 down to four and then none is like, and that's been in the last five to 10 years. So. Yeah. Another question. Um, so I was living in South Texas for a while and we started having like more intense red tide events, especially in the summer. Um, and I was wondering if you knew anything about how um, not to but you know what I mean. Not being able to breathe properly. I guess you're obviously looking at more of what farmers are telling you about red tide, but what's it like red tide in Florida? And is it also getting to the level where it's, you know, areas that cannot be approached for several days and weeks at a time because red tide is not so widespread? So, your question is just about in general how, how, bad is it in terms of like even tourism and things like that? Oh, it's horrible. Yeah. Uh, in the area that I live in, in, in Sarasota, it's been particularly awful. Uh, we have a lot of waterfront property, of course, you can imagine there along the coast and businesses, you know, no one wants to go out there and eat when they smell dead fish. So it's, it's tough. And a lot of people living on canals and things, a lot of the way those tides and everything work just kind of after those fish kills will push everything into those areas. And I think the states tried really hard. Like the last time we had a, a large uh, fish kill, they went out and really tried to um, clean up as quickly as they could and, and keep up with it. But it's just a huge, huge challenge. I mean, they've lost millions and millions of dollars to tourism. Yeah. I mean, of course it impacts the fishery big time and you know, living in one of those states where that's a huge economic driver for us too. People can't come and fish. They're not 
you know, buying gear, buying licenses, staying in hotels, eating at restaurants. So, and just from an environmental standpoint, it's, it's terrible to see all those, you know, big, beautiful fish just rolling up on the shore. So yeah, it's been tough. That's why uh, primarily my work has been up until the last couple of years ago, working uh, with finfish, marine finfish, but because of that uh, challenge, the the lab and some some different um, individuals there have been tasked with a big challenge to solve some of these issues. So we just took it from um, going out and saying, okay, what what does the industry need? And of course, it's not just fish; it's, it's shellfish too in our region. So. Mm -hmm.